you I will set you up for such a time as this father as I bring the word today I speak that God this word of delay is not denial will resonate within our spirits and our souls that God you would activate us into walking into all the faith that we need to run through a troop and leap over a wall Father, I pray that you have your way in this service from the beginning to the end. I pray that everything that comes out of my mouth is of you, Father. And it will be revelatory. It will be life-changing. And every person that walked into this place saying, I need an answer, will walk out with an answer today, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
We're going to let go of our kids. If y'all see some visitors that don't know where the babies go, we have an incredible, I want our, our youth, our children's pastors to wave, Pastor Jason and Esther. Y'all wave at everybody. Those, those people right there are called to your children. They are called to your children. We worship you, oh God. There ain't nothing like you. There ain't nothing like your presence. There ain't nothing like your presence in this place, oh God. We say have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Some of you just need to close your eyes. You need to open your palms to the sky and say, Father, I release everything that's been trying to hold me back. Father, everything the devil's been trying to fight in my marriage, I give it to you. In my finances, I give it to you. Lord, I say, do Ephesians 3.20 in my life. I call forth the exceedingly abundantly more than I could ever ask or think. I'm taking my hands off of it. Some of you just need to just say it. I'm taking my hands off of it. Y'all been trying in your own will, and I hear the Lord saying, you've been holding yourself back. you got to take your hands off of this limitless God. I believe we're walking into a season of abundance. You hear me? It's about time we start walking in abundance, in abundance. Every time life comes and knocks you down, you lay on your back. But sometimes you got to be laying on your back to see Jesus. Instead of detesting the storm, you need to begin to say, Father, have your way. That was the best thing I ever did in my life was tell God, have your way, oh God, not my way, your way. You can't even map out what God has in store for you. You think your life's going good right now, but you wait to get a hiccup. And as long as you got a pulse, you're going to have some storms in your life. But what are you going to do when those storms come? Because God sends storms to make us better and not bitter. Today we're talking about delays or not denials. Honey, I hate delays. How about you? There's an app on my phone that's Waze, and then there's one that's called Google Maps. I love Waze because Waze has a way of finding streets I didn't even know was there. And then it's just such a cool app. It'll tell me when the cops are there, when I got a heavy foot. I know we all, I know y'all ain't never got a heavy foot, but I do. And I love Waze because Waze helps you get to your place quicker. And it'll take you down some roads that'll scare you if it's dark. But that's how our God works. Whenever you're going through detours in life and you're like, what in the world? It's like a Waze map. God is taking you down some short, shorter routes to get to where you need to go. But some of you determine that it's on the wrong, you're on the wrong, that Waze ain't got a clue. And you try to help your Waze map out and you end up in a, in a, in a dead end. Some of you need to trust God. That he's the best director on the planet. I want to welcome all of our, our social media. We just started live streaming today. Now listen, I think some of y'all stayed home today. Hello. Some of y'all stayed home today because you knew we live streaming. But there ain't nothing like being in the presence of God, honey. Something about, something about corporate. When you come into the presence of God, sometimes you got to hijack somebody else's faith. You can't do it when you're at home. <laughs> So y'all better get your behinds back in church next week. I'm going to go today from 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 8. I'm going to give you some things that you can do during your delays that will help you get yourself through. God's favor is on every believer's life through Jesus. Not because of anything we have done or haven't done. You were destined to reign in life because of Jesus. Romans 5, 17 says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundant grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. In John 10, 10, it is a settle, settle the issue you are destined for greatness. 
is basically saying whenever you're in a season of your life that you don't understand, you can't pit stop there. You can't build a tent and stay there. When you're in some uncomfortable situations in life, instead of praying for God to change your circumstances, you need to begin to pray for God to change you for your circumstances. Because the one thing that I discovered about God is it don't matter where you ended up today. You might have ended up right where you are today because of some of your actions. You might have created all these storms that you're in right now. And now you're mad at God because it's raining. But the one thing that I discovered is those storms that I created in ended up being my best life college and whenever I learned from them and I grew from them and I realized the harder I fall the higher I bounce and I stopped being mad at the circumstance and I got glad and I started opening my mouth and praising my way through that's when Jesus came through however as Christians however as surely as God has, impo- has promised that he has made us king and priest to reign in life he also allows times and seasons of testing and perfecting We have to discern the difference between delays and denials or we may lose our peace and stop pursuing our purpose. Because we're looking at that, just that place that is sent there to help us grow. I discovered that in my life, the storms that I created that took me off off, off track were the ones that God used the most to get me where I needed to go. See, if I would have allowed those five years that I was in the valley to keep me down, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. But every single day that I woke up, even when I was driving to a nine to five job and I was mad, I was mad at the world. This ain't where I'm supposed to be. I went from a a very nice car to a hoopty. I was stopped on the side of the road with the car overheating. I could have allowed that season in my life to keep me there. But instead, I allowed those seasons of being broke down on the side of the road to become my life college. Instead of me, I would lay hands on myself every single morning because I'm flesh. I got flesh on me. I still have moments just like y'all do. The difference is I realize that now that God, the devil is fighting me because I'm strong and not weak. And instead of getting pitiful, I got powerful. And every time something's going, acting up in my life. And listen, trust me, when you are a threat to the devil, he's going to fight you. But what you decide to do in those seasons of your brokenness and those seasons where you ain't got an answer, you can realize that he is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And if you just get up and begin to move your foot, even if you don't know where you're going, you might have messed up. You need to get up. You might have gone back, but now you need to get forward and begin just to move and say, God, I don't know what's going on in my life, but I trust you. What are you going to do in those seasons of delays? Whatever you're doing in those seasons, some of you have been in this delayed season for longer than you need to be. Because you are thinking that your, your life is supposed to look like one way. And the one thing that I discovered is my life don't look like nothing like I thought it would. I never dreamed in a million years that just in two years I'd be traveling all over the world, preaching all over the world, have, doing a book and it becoming a bestseller. I never dreamed in all my life that my life was going to look like this because all I ever saw was preachers that were out there saying, I got some dates open if you want to. I was not going to do that. And so I never dreamed that when God gets to the place where he uses you and he says, today you got yourself better and not bitter. So now I'm about to open the windows of heaven over your life. And what was your delay now becomes your promise. Now becomes one moment you went to sleep and one moment you woke up and you feel like you could run through a troop and leap over a wall. One moment the blinders have come off of your eyes and you're driving the same way to work and everything looks bright and beautiful. And you've driven that way for 12 months. But one day, a shift took place. A shift. That's why you got to get yourself unstuck. That's why you can't look at where you're at right now. You got to keep your eyes on the promise. Today, I realize that every situation is different, and every individual is unique. Nevertheless, there are patterns and principles that are timeless and universal. Don't abandon hope. All is not lost, it is time to recover all. But you've got to get started. So now I'm going to tell you a story today. I want to st- here's, here's what I want you to gather first and foremost. You will spend some time in zigzag on your journey. Zigzag is not where we started, nor is it where we're going. It is a place of patient waiting, temporary place located between your prophecy and your destiny. It's that place of building. It's in between that time of whenever you were divorced and now you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've, I've been married for 28 years and now I've got to start over again. And it's those seasons. It was my six years of season as God was preparing me for my promise. He was allowing me to get myself unstuck from the ways of the things that I used to do. And some of you are in that place right now where you feel stuck. But really what God is doing is he's trying to prepare you because listen, you thought God forgot about you. But really what he did was he put you in that place of occlusion, that place of isolation so that whenever he 
he gets you ready to pull you back into your promise. He gets the glory for your story and not somebody else. The one thing that I discovered about my God is people might give up on you, and they will. People might want not call you and check on you. People might, might be texting you. Oh, but they're watching you because what you're going through right now is preparing you for your promise, and everything you're going through right now ain't even for you. It's for your audience. It ain't even for you, boo. What you going through right now? You have any romaine noodles and can't barely sleep at night. You can't even know how you're going to pay your bills. It ain't for you. It's for your audience. God's trusting you with that storm. God's trusting you with that affliction. God's trusting you with that adversary. Because he knows when you come out, you're going to have anointing. When you walk into a room, you ain't even got to open your mouth. You walk in and the whole atmosphere changes. Because in your pursuit of trying to get yourself free, you got an anointing on the inside of you that changes atmospheres without, a, without you even opening your mouth. You're between, between the prophecy and destiny. I love that. Woo! I love when I can bless myself. You're between prophecy and destiny. There is always testing before the refinement. Always. Let's go from 1 Samuel 31 through 8. Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and on Ziklag, and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the woman of all who were in it, both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Now David's two wives had been taken captive. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. Man, he was having a bad, bad, bad day. Not only did his family members get taken, but now the people are turning on him and going to stone him. Some of you can't even go through your day when you see somebody write a Facebook status about you. You, you, you give up and lay in a heap of trouble. You, go, you want retaliation so bad. Y'all can't even go forward whenever God's got a plan and a purpose on your life. If you ain't being talked about, if you ain't being crucified, you ain't no threat. Honey, if you ain't got no haters, you need to start stirring something up. Because haters are the ones that are being used of God. And people that are too jealous to get what they want, they're allowing themselves to be focused on you instead of God. They don't even know you're going through hell because you've learned to praise your way through. Whew. It's my second service. And I preach like, look how sweaty I am. I look like I'm about 900 pounds up here. It's because I give it my all, man. Because you know what? I remember laying in that little bitty bedroom. That 10 by 10 bedroom. I remember losing everything and having to get up to go to a 9 to 5 making $9 an hour. I remember that just two years ago is when God set me free to be in full time ministry. And when you look at what God has done to recover and give me restitution in the last two years whenever God begins to walk you in your purpose you will give everything you've got every inch you got. That's how come people have to go through the storms so that when they open their mouth to preach they don't play. They don't try to be somebody else. They preach from their toes. Woo! Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? If he did it for me, he's going to do it for you. Ain't nothing like my God, you hear me? Woo! Ain't nothing like my God, honey. I don't know about you, but I didn't get God by laying on the floor. <laughs> no, I got up by stepping. You see, every day of my life when the devil's messing with me, he can't get me, so he tries to go after my family. I begin to put my heels on, and I begin to walk around my house, and I begin to prophesy. I begin to call things that are not as though they were. I begin to step on the devil, and some of y'all need to know how to do it. Yo, I'm telling y'all something. Y'all would laugh so hard at me. Y'all would get a kick. I, I need really my own reality show just for myself. Because, honey, if you could see me in that house 
when I hear the devil fighting over my church family, when I hear the devil fighting over my children, whenever I hear the devil trying to take some finances or hurting our church folk, honey, I begin to put my, my, my weapon, my weapons on. I begin to imagine myself in a black cat suit with some big old bit, with some big old boots, and I begin to walk with some intensity, and I begin to take back everything the devil stole from me. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. For all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Hello. Then David said to Alba Harbala, Abbey, the priest, the son of Amalek, please bring me the ephod. So Abathar bought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, pursue for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue them all. Mm. That's what it says. Some of you don't know because you ain't opened your Bible in a minute. You're like, God's moved. No, you've moved. God don't move. He sometimes gets quiet because sometimes the teacher's quiet during the test, but he ain't moved. David's experience, more importantly, his response makes for us a pattern for turning tragedy into triumph. The first thing David did was weep. The first thing that David did, it says in verse 4, that David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no power to weep. The first thing he did was weep. See, living by faith is not living without feelings. You go ahead and weep because joy is coming in the morning. Not tears of defeat, tears of remorse. We need to pass through the valley of weeping, but you can't stay there. That's why when you can come to church and the enemy gets your emotions so that you can come in here and you can just sit there waiting for God to be a genie in a bottle and zap you and give you something. You think that as long as I just sit here, at least I came to church. My grandma said if I come to church, he's going to stick closer to my brother. But you still have a part to play like opening your mouth because the Bible says that your life and death are the power of your words. And sometimes when you ain't got a prayer and you come up into church, you can say, Our Father, all of heaven know the but what you're doing is you're beginning to prophesy through the song and as you begin to keep singing that song with every verse all of a sudden you feel authority like boom shaka like a like a boom devil you're gonna wish you would have messed with somebody else you're gonna wish you would have taken me out when you could because when i tell you what i'm about to come out looking like You're going to wish to God you would have messed with somebody else because I'm about to get better and not bitter. I'm about to get powerful and not pitiful. And I'm about to take back everything the devil stole. In verse 5, it says, And David's two two wives, let's call her Annie. Why would you name your child Anahimom? Annie the Jezreelites. And Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. I really believe that if God would have made a little bit more hood, we would have have read it more. There is a message Bible that is a little bit more hood. But I could see God saying in in David's two wives, Annie, Annie and Jezreel and Abby, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all people was grieved, every man for his son and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. What did he do? He didn't get bitter. He got better. David's day, David's day went from bad to worse. Bitterness does not belong on the road to recovery. It is incredibly destructive. It begins as a seed of offense, then it turns into a root that affects your fruit and what you bear in life, choose to forgive. Opportunities to get bitter are always going to be there. We have to choose not to live there. Why do you think that when you're going through circumstances in your life, the enemy will allow somebody to put up a post on Facebook and you will think it's about you? And then you're hanging out with people from your past that used to enable a bad dysfunction in you that God set you free from. 
And so you're not helping God help you because you keep going back to the people, places, and things. And you wonder how come you're getting bitter instead of getting better because the five people that you are spending the most time with is who you're going to become. It's a proven fact, and it is your prophetic word. It is very easy to pay attention to think people are talking about you. They ain't even thinking about you. I'm not being ugly, but they're going through their own situations in their life. They feel like hell is ripping them apart too because that's how the enemy works. He makes us all think that everything's about us and we end up spending time with people, places and things that are talking about certain people and it's getting a root of evil down on the inside of you and once that bitterness gets a hold of you, you better watch out, baby. One thing that I've discovered is Proverbs 4 says, guard your heart because out of it flows the issues of a life. It means that when you are around people and they're constantly making you feel a certain way, it's getting you off of your off of your journey, off your route. And the enemy's trying to get you with the root of all bitterness because once he gets a hold of you, it's like an octopus and it'll start stretching you. I'm, I'm gonna tell y'all something. Pastor ain't no joke. People are fickle. People talk about the pastors, people talk about the saints. And I am constantly looking at my husband saying, This is the enemy. This is the enemy, and I will say, let's pray right now. Because we are human, and it hurts us just like it hurts you when things happen. But I realize quickly that God is not a God of chaos and confusion. And so when anything is coming against my spirit to make me not feel peace, then it is of the devil. And so I begin to speak to it. I don't only speak and pray for those people, but I pray over myself. Lord, if there is anything in me that is foul and not of you that is going to keep me stuck in this place, I release it from me. I will be, I'll be driving down the street and feel a thought come in my mind. And I'll go, come out! because I never want to go back to that place because I understand that it is my job not my therapist's job not my astrologer job not my priest's job not my prophet whatever you whatever you look for instead of Jesus it ain't their job it's yours and you got to have a connection with God in that place David did not get bitter he got better David's day went from bad to worse bitterness does not does not belong on the road to recover. The third thing that David did was he encouraged himself in God. You have got to encourage yourself in God. You have to praise your way through. David reminded himself of how faithful his God was and is. He didn't have false hope and ignore the problems. He simply magnified the Lord his God above his problems. Don't talk to your God about how big your problems are. Talk to your problems about how big your God is you got to change your perspective. We don't know why the men changed their mind about stoning David, but they did. I believe it was because he changed his perspective. And he stopped worrying about them stoning him, and he started praising his way through. He started thinking, God, if I'm about to get stoned, I'm going to praise you till my last breath. So he took his perspective off of the bad things that were happening in his life and began to focus on worshiping and praising God in the midst of his storm. Yeah, that's good. Verse 7 said, then David said to Abathar, the priest, Amalekite's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. What, what? That's how he rolls. If he's just 320, Maryland, he's going to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. That's how our God rolls. So what was the number four thing that he did? He got a word from God. You need to focus. You need focused faith more than anything else during the season. Notice David didn't ask, Lord, should we stay here and wait on you? He asked, should we get up and go? God's directive will always get you moving from your seat of comfort. He will always require you to participate in your recovery because faith requires action. That's how come the enemy gets you paralyzed in your mess and you can't even hardly move. You feel like a turtle stuck in peanut butter. When depression hits your life, you don't even want to get up in the morning. 
If you start focusing on why this blessing ain't happening, God promised you this, and it don't look like this yet, and so you get stuck on stupid back there whenever God is saying over here, if you just take one more forward step, even if you don't understand, you watch where I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet you. I'm going to meet your promise with your purpose just like that, but I need you to quit concentrating on what I haven't done yet and begin to pursue what I'm about to do. What was the fifth thing he did? You have to reorient your vision. You have to remind yourself where you are seated in heavenly places. You have to change your vision from defeat to victory. From loss to recovery. God wants you to recover all. He wants you living a life of victory, not defeat. He is for you. He loves you. He has favored you. Keep your mind on the vision Increase your capacity for larger vision. Let hope paint a new picture on the canvas of your imagination. This is why I love vision boards. This is why I love journals. Because what happens is during your season of healing, during your season where God has taken you from glory to glory, in that place where you ain't heard God for about five years, in that place whenever your ex walks out on you and you got to start over, in that place of bankruptcy when you're still working $9 an hour and can't even afford romaine noodles, in the season of having to do over, you're going to realize that when God gives me my do over, I'm not going to do over the way I did, but instead I'm going to be focused on the promises of what God says for me and I'm about to let him pull me back like a slingshot and re realize that God is not just doing restoration. He's giving restitution in my life and everything the devil stole, he going to give me back. But he ain't going to give me back what I lost because I don't want what I lost. I want better. I want bigger. I want more of God. The Bible says, the Bible says that that men have free will. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. It's why you can't get stuck when you, when you lose, have a miscarriage. That's why you can't get stuck whenever you get fired. That's why you can't get stuck whenever somebody walks out on you. you got to start realizing that this was part of life, and this person had free will. That baby didn't die because God didn't want to bless that baby. It's just called life. Sometimes your umbilical cord ain't in the right place, and the fallopian tube don't attach, and something just happens. But the one thing that I discovered about my God, if you get unstuck off of this one and start praising God that that baby's in heaven watching over you, then God's going to fill your womb with a double portion. But you got to get away from being broken over here and begin to praise God over here and get your eyes off of this one mistake and bless God for what's coming you got to reorientate your vision the next thing you got to do is regain your passion what I don't know about you but honey every time I need to lose weight I couldn't fit my clothes and I had back boobs I wanted to go get some phenamine from the doctor so I could just stop eating but that don't work it might work for a minute and you might lose some weight but in a minute you put a ho-ho back in your mouth you're going to be that's just like Dr. Atkins. We walk around eating all the ranch we want, all the salads we want, all the meat we want. We eating all this good food, and we're losing like 50 pounds, and we're fitting in all these great clothes, and we feel so good about ourselves. But how many of you know you can't eat salads with ranch on them for the rest of your life? At some point, you're going to want a Big Mac. And you're going to put that Big Mac in your mouth, and all of a sudden, you're going to be like, Poof. it's like you're going to just be popping out of your clothes. Because you got to have passion. Whenever you finally get sick and tired of them back boobs, you finally get up and start getting yourself outside, and you start running, and you put the ho-hos down. You get up off the couch from crash, scratching your behind, eating your bonbons, and you begin to put some work in it, some sweat in it, and then all of a sudden you start watching your body change and muscle come, and ooh, you can fit in them clothes again. You've got to regain your passion. That's just like with God, man. You've got to quit wondering why and begin to say, why not? You gotta regain. You gotta get fired up because the next move is yours. Some of y'all been waiting on God, but the next move is yours. You gotta start moving in the direction of your vision, one step at a time. Life's a marathon, not a sprint. Passion is required for action. Sooner or later, you have to get mad at the devil and the havoc he is wreaking in your life. And desire will give you the drive to do something about it. Situation, passivity will paralyze you. That's how come the enemy gets you with passivity. The enemy gets you with just being stuck. You're sitting at the house. You're in that room. You can't even hardly get up. You're so depressed. Not only did you lose your family, but now you lost all your money. 
Not only did you lose all your money, but now you've been eating your problems. You can't even fit in your clothes no more. You ain't even put makeup on in forever because what the heck? I didn't even, I couldn't even keep nobody. So why should I get up and even try today? But what I had discovered about God is that if you would just wake up one morning and put one foot in front of the other and begin to say, God, I don't know how far I can go today, but I'm going to at least start brushing my hair today. I'm going to at least start putting some makeup on today. I'm going to at least start allowing myself to turn on some worship music today and begin to walk through my house decreeing and declaring. I'm going to take my Crisco and I'm going to put it on all my door frames in my house, on my computer, and I'm going to begin to call back everything the devil stole. I'm going to begin to prepare for what I'm praying for because one day before I know it, I'm going to be driving to work and all of a sudden I'm going to get a phone call and it's going to be somebody want me to come preach in their church and I got to be prepared. If I'm not prepared, then I will fall flat and I will miss the opportunity because God says many are called but few are chosen. So that means I got to prepare because this is not where I'm staying. The next thing you got to do is get ready and attack. You got to attack. You got to attack. You got to reorientate your vision. You got to regain your passion. And you got to get ready to attack. You got to fight from a position of victory, not for a position of victory. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places far above the enemy. With the only weapon we have, the word of God is a sword to our spirit. Some of you walked in here today and you didn't even sleep last night. You feel so defeated. You're so sick of life as normal. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You're like, I'm so sick and tired of life as normal. I'm so tired of waking up and going through the same hell every day. I'm so sick of not being able to sleep at night because I'm fighting weapons that didn't even prosper. I'm I'm using my little mustard seed of faith on little pebbles. I want to be more than God has called me to be, so I'm getting ready to attack. I'm going to get myself in position so that when anything tries to come at me, when the bullets of life hit me, when things start dragging me down, when the creditors start calling me, when my ex starts attacking me, I'm going to be able to stand firm with my with my protection and the bullets are just going to be lassoing off of me because God said I can run through a troop and leap over a wall and that I am invisible. He says in Philippians 4.13 that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Bring it on, devil. Bring it on. I make sure now, Vanessa, when I begin to pray and sing, I sing as loud as I can. I pray as loud as I can. I prophesy over myself and my family more than I pray. And I do it loud because I know the devil's deaf. And I want him to hear me. I want him to know every time he starts reminding me of my past that I can remind him of his future. And he ain't got one. Oh, but I do. Because God said my ladder shall be great. God said in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to bless you and not harm you. Give you hope and a future. And then the verses after that said, If you see Seek me, you'll find me. If you knock, the door will be open. But see, when the enemy paralyzes you, you can't knock. You can't go after it. You can't prophesy because the enemy's got your tongue lassoed down. Second thing is you got to attack. The eighth thing that you got to do in your delay is you got to recover all. You got to recover all. Position and prepare yourself for total recovery. Restoration is the love story of the Bible. It is all about recovering all, whether it is the lost, whether it is health, finances, relationships. Total recovery is a plan in the garden. It was always about establishing the kingdom of God through dominion. We are not to be dominated. We are to be the dominators. Ephesians 3.20 says it. He's going to do exceedingly abundantly above The ninth thing you got to do in delay is you got to go ahead and start celebrating recovery. You got to go ahead and start celebrating the things. Your child out, you don't even know where they're at, strung out on drugs. You got to start celebrating. Lord, I thank you that this kid's going to come in. He's going to be a prophet. He's going to sing the rafters off the walls. This boy's going to be so anointed. He's going to rip people out of hell. You got to start calling it forth. You got to recover all. Position yourself. The next one is celebrate recovery. On the worst day of your life, you can never predict how God will bring about recovery. Much less how God will make something worth celebrating out of the ugly ashes that have come to dominate your present. But he will believe this. Faith is the audacity to believe such outrageousness, such outrageous claims. That unfathomable goodness can come from unbearable tragedy. 
Faith is the audacity to believe that when you have lost it all, you will not only recover it, but you will also live to celebrate the recovery. Believe in God that, God, I don't know where I'm going. I can't see what you're doing. You know, my life looks like I have lost everything, that I've made such a mess of my life that I can't see. But God, princess, he says, you're going to be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Sometimes you just got to get up and start moving. You're going back to that same nasty job with that bully boss, ain't never getting credit for anything you've ever done. And instead, you're walking in that place before you get there. And you're saying, Father, I decree and declare that today is the last day they pick on me. Today is the last day that I stay in this place. Lord, you are elevating me. You're sending me to positions I didn't even know I was in line for. Lord, you are positioning me from the pit to the palace. And I'm claiming that this is a week that you're changing things for my favor. Lord, I thank you right now that I'm the head and not the tail. I decree and declare that I'm the top and not the bottom. I decree and declare that I shall live and not die. I speak to my marriage to be healed. I speak to my children to recover. I speak to my body to be healed in Jesus' name. I can't stand lazy Christians y'all don't belong in this church if you're a lazy Christian because this church is where we activate you can't be going to the same church for a whole year and you still looking the same and still looking like you can cry in your Kool-Aid. You got to begin to get somewhere. You got to begin to resurrect out of those ashes. You can't stay stuck. You got to get unstuck and go forward. Man, that's a, that's the desire for me and my husband. Is to see our people walking in freedom. I did it for so many years, y'all. I literally allowed myself to play church. I'd walk around with Bethel playing. I'd just walk around. Ooh, ooh, oh, thank you, Jesus. And nothing was changing. And then I realized it can't just be us worshiping with Bethel. We got to begin to activate. We got to begin to begin to speak something. We got to begin to help God help us by getting ourselves unstuck from those relationships that are holding us hostage, that are making us cry every day, the ones that are making us go back to places that God has set us free from. And we got to begin to walk in our anointing and realize that it's not just me that he's anointed. He's anointed you to do what I did, what I'm doing, to preach to nations, to preach at your jobs, to walk in favor, to walk in abundance you shouldn't be not having no money in your bank account not when you're a king's kid he says in his word that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us if that power lives in us how can you walk around like this How, if the power is in you, when you go to the doctor and they say you got cancer, you go, oh, you go plan your funeral. If the power is in you, when you get a bad doctor's report, you shall say, whose report will you believe? I believe God every time. When your husband gives you a di divorce decree, you lay hands on that thing and say, I decree that my marriage is going to be healed. I'm sorry. I'm not one of those preachers going to pacify you and rub you. It's okay, baby. It's okay. No. I want you to be running through a troop, baby. I want Church of the Harvest to be running and leading the way for revival. I want Church of the Harvest to have a flame going up at the top of the ceiling and people can't even get in this church because something happens when they walk in this place over the threshold. They start realizing that God has called them and the storm that they're in right now is not even for them, it's for their audience because people may not be calling you, they may not be talking to you, they may not be texting you, oh, but they're watching you. You got to get through this for everybody watching you. You got to get through what you're in right now for the audience that God is about to reveal you to. You just need a break. You're just wondering how come God, it feels like he's taking his anointing off of your life. 
But in reality, what he's doing is he's been covering you. He's been protecting you. He's isolated you because whenever he turns the light on in your life and he begins to put your face in front of people's in front of people's dreams, where all of a sudden he starts, that's how God rolls. That's how he qualifies you. You don't know how in the world it's opening up for you. But what's happening is God is putting your face in people's dreams. He's allowing people to come across you on the timeline of Facebook. And all of a sudden he begins to open doors that no man could shut because once God begins to open the doors, you're going to be like, hold up! You watch, man. The only thing greater than recovering all by the grace of God is to be an agent of God's grace in, in the lives of others. We have to begin to pay it forward. we got to help them to recover all. To do this, we must be givers. We must be willing to give generously, even sacrificially. We must move beyond obsession with our own joy and sorrow and acknowledge the significance of others. In this life, we will all have bad days. Some may be so bad that recovery seems impossible. There's some of you in this place, you don't even know how. How can recovery? I can't even see how I'm going to pay my bills. I'm all bulb just discombobulated, and I end up getting all my bills called up, and then I get stuck again, having to start all over again. I finally get out of this hole, and then all of a sudden I get ahead, and then I get another pitfall. What God's trying to get you to do is begin to activate your faith, and in that season of paralyzation where you feel like he has taken you and stuck you there, but it's really the, in, in, the, 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 the middle of between your promise and your purpose. And in that place, you begin to exercise your anointing, laying hands on yourself and saying, God, if there is anything in me that is making me keep going back around this track over and over, God, I give you permission to take it out of me. God, in my flesh may fail me, but you won't. So, God, in this season, I just want you, some of you won't pray for God to reveal those places inside of you because you're afraid of what he might reveal. And you are so afraid of having to go to the bottom of yourself that you won't even pray that. That's why you've been stuck for so long. But in this season, I dare you to begin to pray, God, whatever it is on the inside of me that is keeping me paralyzed. I want to work for you, but I can't. I want to get out of this. I keep re repeating cycles in marriage, and I keep repeating cycles in friendships, and nobody wants to be there for me, and I keep acting like I got it all together, but I'm tore up inside. God, I realize what I'm going through is for you, but God, I got to feel some of you just need to learn to lay hands on yourself and say, God, take this numbness off of me. Some of you have walked through tragedy so bad in your life that you can't even feel. Family's forsaken you. People have walked out on you and abandoned you. And somewhere inside you think of God as really a good father. And you've ended up putting walls around your spirit, your soul. And it's keeping God out. You bite everybody's head off every day. You're constantly yelling. And every time you even walk into work, people looking outside the blinds to see if you smile on your face or not. Because you're allowing the season that you're in to dictate your whole lifetime. You're making everybody else pay for your anger and your bitterness and your brokenness. Instead of realizing that God's got a purpose and a plan for everything that you're going through. Even the bitterness, even the brokenness, even the daddy issues. Your family's all discombobulated because of the addiction that is running rapid in your family. Because somebody that's so broken that they don't really feel like God will be there for them because nobody's ever been there for them. And I hear God saying, he loves you. Oh, I hear God saying, you just wait. What God is about to do in your life, you held on for such a time as this. You believed and you prayed and you got yourself and set up right in the point where you finally said, God, whatever you got to do in my life, I know that you're working all things together for my good. I know, God, that the next season that I'm walking in, Lord, I see now that it was not denial. It was just a delay. Oh, he's got you. I hear him saying it.
He's got you. Oh, he's got you. <laughs> oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet, says the Lord. Oh, he's got you. He's got you. He's healing some daddy issues in here. Some men that had had a father in your life. He's, oh, he's got you. He's going to use your pain as a purpose. He's going to use that delay, that denial of a father's love, of a mother's love, of a spouse's love, that death that you had to go through and you're bitter at God because you're grieving the process. Oh, he's got you. Oh, he's going to use your passion and your purpose through the storm as your anointing. He's going to pull you back like a slingshot. He's going to let you fly. He's moving you from the pit to the palace. Oh, he says, he's got you. I hear God saying it right now. Some of you need to stand up on your feet and just say, oh, God, I receive it. Oh, y'all listen to me. There's a lot of tears flowing in this place, and tears are awesome because they're the safety valve of the heart. And something happens when you finally get an encounter with God and your perspective changes. And God spoke to me this morning. I got up at 6 o'clock this morning. I was laying before the Lord. And all I kept hearing him say is, I'm about to change some perspective. I'm about to shift some perspective, Marilyn. I'm about to, what seemed like big old mountains in people's lives were just really molehills. But the enemy had you stuck there. And I'm telling you something, this week, you're going to begin to see we've got testimonies all over the place from people that are being free from their own thinking, from their own mind, people that have been broke down for years from a divorce that are finally beginning to live again. Because it's a true fact that you've got to learn sometimes just to tell your heart, it's time for my heart to beat again. It's time for me to walk in the abundance and the fulfillment of Christ. It is time for me to walk in joy, unspeakable and full of glory, even when I can't see what God is doing. Even when the storms of life are beating me up, I'm going to hold fast it to know that just like he spoke the calm to the storm, he's going to speak the calm to my storm. But while I'm surfing the storm, I'm going to be getting all that I need to get from God. Because he's got you. He's got you. He's got you. Father, I thank you right now. For every person that made their way into this place today. That God, we're going to get into alignment with you. So that Father, all the things that we're staring at. This is what I hear the Lord saying. All the things that you walked in with today. God said, some of those storms you created, but it did not take me by surprise. And that I'm about to open the windows of heaven over that, and I'm going to begin to use every storm that you made. And I'm going to begin to renew and renew your mind. I'm going to begin to make the crooked way straight. And I'm going to begin to make the mountains melt like wax. And your tears are going to go from morning to a new morning. I see God saying, Grace, today in this place, you're seeing what it looks like when mercy meets your mess. There's a lot of men in this place today. This sermon was probably more for you. Because that perspective shift with you being the head of your house, it gets really hard to know what to do in the tough times. You go to bed and you pray, God, don't let me let my family down. You're carrying the weight of the world, but I hear the Lord saying, he's so proud of you, sir. He is so proud of you, and you are doing a good job. 
It doesn't matter how many mistakes you made in the past. God said, I'm going to use every one of those mistakes. You will not have to live in the ramifications of your mistakes if you just line up and hold those shoulders back and begin to praise your way through, begin to lay hands on your wife, begin to speak life over your children, begin to live again, begin to realize that this is not the way your story is going to end, that because you're the priest of that home, you can begin to speak into your family's life. God said, I've got you. You are not by yourself. I've got you, man of God. You are walking into a new season with your family where you're going to have more than enough, where you're going to feel victory, where you're going to feel joy, where you're going to feel freedom. Oh, I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. I just hear God say, it. ain't that sweet? He says, I got you. He says, I got you. Man, y'all going to wake up in the morning. Let me just tell you something. You're going to go to bed tonight. You're going to close your eyes. You're going to have the best sleep you've ever had in your life. See, y'all don't know what he's gone through. Y'all don't know the mountains that he's... You don't know the, the alabaster in his box. You, you don't know why his praise is the way it is. You don't know how long he's cried for a word like he got today. That finally died. His family's okay. Oh, I got you. Yay! God's raising up men in this church. God's raising up men in this church. God's raising up men that are on fire for God. God is raising up men that are leading their families. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm looking around and seeing men with tears running down their faces. Devil, take that. Devil, take it. Yes. God is raising up men, and I knew it. I knew it. My husband is a strong man of God. God is raising up men in this house that are going to open their mouths. We got a giant standing back there at about 6'5". Looks like he is a bodybuilder with big old tears running down his face. You tell me God is not a good, good father. You tell me that God can't heal a mess in a moment. You tell me that in the presence of God, if you just go halfway, he'll meet you there. I think he probably just started it for the men. You watch what about to happen in this place. One outburst of a Goliath. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's got you. He's got you. Father, I pray, Lord, as we leave this place today, as we prepare for our offering. <laughs> Pray, God, for revival in this place. God, we don't want to be in your way. We don't want to stop you, God. But, God, I see every week people changing, man. I could just, they look like new individuals. <laughs> and, Lord, I just call people from the north, south, east, and west into this place, Lord. Where, God, there's a revival setting and touching our lives. Where marriages are healed and restored. Where drug addicts are set free just by walking over the threshold of this place. Where God, people that are just numb from molestation and being abused as children, God, that when they walk into this place, that God, 40 years of pain is broken off of them. We thank you, Lord, for your healing. God, we're so thankful that me and Mark get to pastor such an awesome church. With such awesome people that are so on fire for God. And Lord, we pray that we always stay in the right mind. Always pursuing you. Always pursuing your agenda. And Lord, we welcome your presence in this place as we go forth. 
Father, I decree and declare that, Father, we're the head and not the tail. We're the top and not the bottom. Lord, that no weapon formed against us will prosper this week. Father, that we are lenders and not borrowers. That, God, our bank accounts are going to be in six figures instead of negative, God. I thank you, Lord, that we are walking in health and strength. That no, no sickness, no disease can attack our body, Lord. I command all emotional, all emotional situations and minds to be broken, God. Emotional sicknesses be broken, God. And Lord, I thank you that you're giving us amnesia in our minds of past. That we're not rehearsing the things that have happened, but God, we're going to walk forward focused on you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Y'all may be seated. One more second.